Hi everyone, uh, welcome to 87 Stanford Media I Group Exchange Session. This week we have uh, Alex Rekas from uh, Erasmus University Medical Center Netherlands here with us to talk about his work on risk-based approaches to the assessment of treatment effect heterogeneity. Alex is a PhD student at the Department of Medical Informatics of Erasmus University Medical Center in Netherlands. His research uh, focuses on risk prediction and its use of guiding medical decisions. He's an active member of OHDSI Collaborative, which promotes large-scale observational research through the adoption of an open community data standard. He has a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece, and a master's degree in statistics from Gain Luven. Alex, thank you very much for joining us today. Before we start, do you have any preference on how you would like to take questions? Uh, just uh, stop me. Uh... Nope. Anytime, uh, yeah. Perfect. Uh, so everyone, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. And without further ado, let me hand it over to Alex. Okay. Okay. You can see my screen, I guess. I hope. Yes, sir. Yes, we can. Uh, okay. So hi, everyone. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me and showing interest in my work uh, to present it here today. Uh, Yes, so this presentation is going to be uh, based on a combination of uh, the work we have, we have been doing during my PhD since the beginning. And uh, it's going to be focused on uh, risk-based approaches to the assessment of uh, term effect heterogeneity, which is the general theme of my PhD. Um, yeah, let me, okay, so first uh, to, to set things up, and it, uh, I want to I'd like to start with a literature review that uh, we carried out when I started my PhD. And uh, the aim was to, uh, in order for me to get acquainted with the literature, so we were looking for uh, regression-based approaches in the literature for uh, evaluating uh, treatment effect heterogeneity in the, uh, in the RCT setting, so in randomized uh, controlled trials. Uh, so this resulted in the identification of two main approaches for uh, uh, doing that. So the first approach is the treatment effect modeling approach. So this is what uh, this is like the most straightforward approach. So you assume that the conditional uh, that, that the expected out uh, the expectation of the outcome uh, given the covariance and treatment is just a function of, of this covariance and. Uh, uh, treatment and this uh, means that you model some, uh, you use uh, some regression model to model these uh, like uh, some uh, main effects of the covariates plus this, some interactions of these uh, covariates uh, with the treatment. Um, so even though this is the most uh, straightforward approach and uh, it actually makes sense to, to do that, uh, there are very there are there are many uh, issues when you're trying to do that, especially in the RCT setting where your data is uh, not that big. So uh, in in the absence of uh, some uh, well-established effect modifiers, then uh, usually this may end up uh, being uh, uh, some sort of uh, fishing expedition where you're modeling uh, different covariant interactions and then you're losing power very fast and then. Uh, your predictions become very noisy in the end. Um, so, uh, and a, a different approach to this is uh, in order to reduce this. Uh, ah, and uh, yeah, I say, but I, I talked about the uh, RCT setting, but uh, even in the observational setting, where you, if you have like a database with a lot of, uh, even if you have a lot of patients, if you're uh, Usually, you have also your 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 the number of covariates also increases, right? So you, you may think that in the observational setting this problem is not doesn't exist, but in reality this exists because you end up having like hundreds or even thousands of covariates, and then again figuring out what to what interactions to model becomes even even trickier. Um, so a way to uh, try to avoid this uh, problem is. Uh, that we found in the literature it was is to instead of modeling uh, treatment covariate interactions is to model an inter interactions of treatment with some uh, fixed uh, um, summary score of these uh, covariates and uh, and this fixed transformation 
uh, that that makes sense to use is uh, actually the baseline risk because the risk uh, is uh, is uh, is estimated using some sort of regression model where you're modeling uh, main effects of some of of the risk factors and then usually you expect that the that baseline risk is a determinant of the benefit that you're expecting. So with higher risk, you expect to see higher benefits. Uh, if you assume that there is a constant, that there is a, some benefit in these treatments overall, right? Um, so the, the so these these approaches usually are, are carried out like in, in two steps, right? So in the first step, you need to and to come up with some sort of uh, risk prediction model so you can use that to then. Put it in a second in the second step in a in a regression model where you in, where you model these interactions of the baseline risk with the treatment. Um, so the so it is um, um, so this uh, this actually reduces the dimensionality problem. So now you're only modeling like some interaction of uh, of treatment with the summary score, but uh, this. Of course, doesn't come free. So there are there are several problems when you're doing that, and uh, the main thing is that conceptually, so you're you're assuming that uh, uh, the 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 the, the, the covariates that go into the risk prediction model are actually also all of them modifying uh, treatment effect, and not only that, they're modifying treatment effect in the same direction as they're modifying risk. Right, so in the end, it ends up uh, being some sort of uh, trade of which approach uh, makes sense. Um, so in, in this uh, in this work, we're focusing mainly on risk modeling approaches because uh, we want to, because these are these are methods that have seen less uh, uh, less attention attention and uh, they they are very interesting to look at. Um, so, uh, Alexa, I have a yeah. uh, question. Can you give an example of risk here? Like, what do you mean by risk? Ah, yeah. Uh, so, the, the, like a baseline risk for a, for an outcome of interest. So, like if like a, like more acute myocardial infarction in patients with hypertension. So you, you like any model that predicts this outcome, like a, like a logistic regression model or. A, uh, yeah, any 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 yeah, any model that gives you like a probability for a certain outcome. So, are you saying the risk of uh, in the prediction of the model? Uh, okay, no. So it's like uh, I mean that the prediction of the model. Not yeah. So the yeah, the risk is because I don't know. Um, so it's so if you have. You have patients with uh, hypertension. Want to predict for them uh, their chances of having an acute myocardial infarction, right? And then you fit a model, and then you, this model gives you predictions. That's these predictions. That's, that's what I call the risk. I'm not sure. Did that confuse you? That's, it, I'm not talking about the risk of the prediction model as uh, a metric of the for the evaluation of the prediction model. So basically, it's, your model would be estimating the risk itself. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Is this clear? Or, uh... Uh, so, so far, my understanding is kind of like when a model predict a diagnosis, uh, uh, this estimation of that risk of the diagnosis. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, like, like your your prediction is like your ten year risk is two percent. Like in the, in the next ten years, it's two percent chance you're going to get the outcome, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, the so recently there were uh, two publications that uh, uh, proposed uh, these kind of approaches, like a risk risk modeling approaches, and they uh, assessed the situations where these approaches would be more suitable and proposed like a framework how to do this uh, kind of approaches. But they mainly focused they only focused on the on the randomized control trial setting. And uh, uh, but uh, and, and now, but the idea is that we one of the of, of the 
future things that they wanted to do was to actually expand to the observational uh, setting. Um, and uh, because we work uh, very close with, this, uh, with some of these people, we actually took on this uh, task. Um, so the the uh, the yeah. So the issue is that uh, for the so to set up the background for this thing is that uh, first of all in the um, in our department and uh, in our uh, and mainly our group is heavily involved in the uh, observational health data science and informatics uh, group the OHDSI Odyssey. And uh, this uh, is an international community of researchers that are trying to uh, to bring out the value from observational data to actually improve uh, healthcare. And at the core of this uh, community lies the OMOP, the OMOP uh, common data model. And uh, this means and uh, this means that any database that is part of the Odyssey has the same exact structure, right? So they use the same uh, uh, tables and the same uh, uh, coding for uh, diseases and treatments and uh, uh, demographics and all this stuff. So this means that if I write code that works on, uh, on my database, then this code should work in any database that belongs in this, uh, uh, in this community. And uh, so this, the scalability capabil uh, capabilities are, are, are very big, right? Because you can apply your, your, uh, your uh, you can start with working, doing this network studies where you can compare, combine results from multiple uh, databases from, uh, from around the world. And then you can hopefully do more, uh, gen provide more generalizable results, right? So, um, our goal here was uh, now we had two main goals here. So first, we wanted to uh, translate this uh, this uh, path statement to the observational to the observational setting, and also when we do that, we wanted to generate to provide to provide the the software that you can use that can be actually that is actually compatible with the Odyssey, with the OMOP common data model. And then this means that you can use it uh, across any database that is mapped to the OMOP common data model. Um, and this resulted in the definition of a five-step framework, framework that we developed. So, so these five steps are uh, as, as follows. So the first step, we need to define the problem. And uh, for this, we need to define at least uh, three cohorts. So here, in, in, within the here, we use, we use the the word cohort, the term cohort, uh, it, a little bit different than the and it's expected in uh, the like in more epidemiological kind of uh, studies. So here, a cohort is a set of patients of people that. Uh, fulfill certain criteria for a, for a certain amount for a certain amount of time, right? So, like a cohort of patients, uh, a cohort of patients that receive ACE inhibitors is a, a cohort of patients that that have certain like uh, diagnosis in their past, and then they also receive ACE inhibitors, and then we can they belong in this cohort for as long as they're like. Uh, in the database, or if they if we define like a stopping point, then we can throw them out. Um, so these three cohorts that we need to define is a treatment cohort, a comparator cohort, and uh, one or more outcome cohorts. Um, and then in the second step, we need to identify the database that we're going to use, and uh, this can be any database now mapped to the OMOP common data model because. Uh, and that's where target. That's where we're targeting our uh, approaches. Um, and when we have these databases, then now we can use our, our cohort definitions because across all of them, because they are all mapped to the own common data model now. And then we can extract these databases, these uh, these cohorts, like the treatment compiler and the outcome cohorts. Uh, in, the th in the third step, we we carry out our prediction. So we do that by pulling the treatment and compiler cohorts into a single cohort, and then we fit the prediction model. 
this this uh, this can be any model that uh, that you desire. For for our case, we're using uh, uh, a package called patient level prediction, which has been developed by the Odyssey community and. It's actually compatible with the OMOP common data model, and it provides you a large library of uh, prediction models that can, you can fit. Usually, we end up using uh, some sort of lasso logistic regression uh, uh, model. We see that this works usually fine, and it's uh, easy to, uh, to fit. Um, in the fourth step, now we, when we have our model, now we can use this model to predict on the on our uh, on our uh, to, to derive our patient level predictions, and then we can use these predictions to stratify the population into risk strata. And um, so, and then we, when we have separated the population into risk strata, then we can we do the following: we first uh, fit, we first develop uh, fit uh, propensity score models within risk strata, right, for its database. And then we evaluate a set of uh, standard diagnostics to see um, if we have achieved, uh, if, if we see if we have any evidence that we are we are uh, have we have like residual confounding or if we are managing to account for or observed confounding. And uh, once we do that, then we can if we see that, that we don't fail our diagnostics, then we can proceed with the estimation of. Uh, Prism effects both on the relative and on the absolute scale in each database, and then in the final step, in the final step, we combine all these results into uh, a single uh, table or or whatever or a plot where we can then, we can then uh, evaluate uh, the overall uh, evolution of uh, treatments within with uh, with uh, with risk, right? Um, yeah, so we demonstrated this uh, this. Uh, um, our framework into the into the field of hypertension, where we compared uh, the effect of uh, thiazides to ACE inhibitors with to patients with established uh, hypertension, and we focused on uh, 12 outcomes. We had three main outcomes, which were acute myocardial infarction, hospitalization with heart failure, and uh, stroke. We had another set of uh, nine safety outcomes. These were all outcomes that were uh, related to one or to one or the other treatment, uh, usually that in the literature. Um, uh, for our databases, we used three uh, claims databases from the U.S. Um, uh, so we mainly used these databases because we it was easier for us to get access to these. Um, so the first one was uh, the commercial database uh, CCAE. This includes. Uh, uh, claims uh, from uh, patients uh, who are who actually work in the U.S. Right, so who are like, who are, who are uh, uh, insured in the U.S. Uh, because of, from their employer and and uh, stuff like that. And uh, the second database was the Medicaid database. So it's uh, patients in the U.S. that have uh, that are covered by the Medicaid uh, programs in several states. And the last database was uh, MDCR, which uh, is, includes data from uh, retired patients. So even though we had we picked these databases because it was easier for us to access them, we see that we get some good coverage of the population we get of, of the US. Right? Um, Hi, Alex. Uh, can I stop yeah. here? Uh, with these three databases, how do they connect to OMOP? Uh, did you have to convert these to OMOP format? or? Yeah, so... Already... The, yeah. So this is yeah. So this is a huge amount of work, but fortunately we don't have to do it. So this has already been done. So these databases, they're, 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 they have been mapped from their source to the OMO common data model by specialists who actually train how to do this uh, this thing, and we get access to the mapped database. So we can directly start working on it without uh, having to do any. All the quality checks and everything has been done before, before, and clean up and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for uh, so we see. So I put this table here just to see like the number of patients that we get uh, after we extract our uh, cohorts, and then you see that for uh, in CCA, which was which is actually the largest one, we get uh, more than 1.2 million patients. 
receiving both statements. In MDCD, we have more than 160,000. And then in MDCR, which is the smallest one, 142,000 uh, almost. Um, yeah, and we see that uh, mainly like patients, we have patients that we have to, between two and three times more patients receiving ACE inhibitors compared to thiazide. Um, yeah. Uh, so for for the prediction step now, uh, in the prediction step, we focused on the prediction of uh, acute myocardial infarction, and we 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 did that by developing separate prediction models within each database, and uh, we did so by fitting a lasso logistic regression. Um, for uh, yeah, so we pulled the the, ACE, the thiazides and ACE inhibitor patients into one cohort, and then we developed a prediction model for it. And we fit the logistic regression model for the prediction of uh, acute myocardial infarction to this combined uh, set of patients, and then we stratify the population into uh, three risk strata. So we have the low, the lower risk patients, which are below one percent risk. The the, the medium range patients which are between 1 and 1.5 percent and the uh, uh, higher risk patients which are above 1.5 percent uh, uh, acute MI risk. Uh, yeah so here I uh, so I, here in the last row I saw the, the performance of the of the prediction models uh, across databases so we see that in, in MDCR our prediction is a bit uh, the quality that our AUC, this is AUC, right? So our AUC is a bit lower compared to the other two. Um, oh, yeah. I yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide? So, uh, so you're basically training three different models for three different databases, or it's just one model that you're testing across three databases? Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's one model per database. So it's three different prediction models. But we're using the same cutoffs for each prediction. So the, the, the cutoffs are shared between prediction models, but we have different prediction models for each database. Yeah. Okay. And that's matched treatment and comparator is matched as when the, when the treatment and comparator cohorts have been combined. That's, that's what you mean by matched population? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so for the, for uh, now that we have separated the population into risk strata, we can proceed with our standard diagnostics, right? So if we first, uh, so in, in one database, so we have the prediction model, we fit the prediction model, we separate the population based on the, on the risk, and then within its risk group, we fit a, a new, we fit a separate propensity score model to account for the observed compounding, right? Um, so, and then within each risk group, we evaluate this, uh, this set of standard diagnostics that we can, uh, that are, I'm gonna talk about now. So the first diagnostic we check is the preference score distribution. This is a preference score is, a, is just, is a, just a simple um, modification of the propensity score, which takes into account the treatment, uh, uh, the prevalence of treatments, right? So, because there, you may have very unbalanced uh, treatment arms. Uh, so what you want, so in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the clinical trial setting, what you would expect to see is that these, these overlap exactly, right? right? Because, uh, so you, no, they don't just overlap, there's a zero, I mean, would, they would be 0 0.5, right? Because if you're like a 50-50 chance, they would be 0 0.5. Uh, but so the more apart they become, then it's, it becomes easier to separate these uh, uh, patients that receive the thiazides and patients who receive ACE inhibitors. And this means that they're less and less comparable, right? So we, the more you see the overlap, then the less comparable these cohorts become. And then it's harder for you to so the, the effect estimates that you're going to derive in the end, they don't, maybe they're not very uh, trustworthy. So we see here that in the case of CCAE for uh, the, the higher risk group, we see that uh, actually, there's actually a lot of separation. And here, 
there's there's uh, there's uh, some like a, an alert that the, these in the high risk group uh, the effect estimates may not be so uh, trustworthy and if maybe in the lower risk also so there's no fixed uh, rule of thumb for that but usually it's like a visual inspection unfortunately um, so the second diagnostic is the covert balance before and after uh, adjustment for the propensity scores and, uh, and this is uh, the uh, here we plot the standardized mean difference before the for each covariate mm -hmm. the standardized mean difference before our before our adjustment for uh, propensity score and then after that and uh, usually the rule of thumb here is that you would like this that after adjustment you would like the the uh, standardized mean difference to be below 0 0.1 this is like a rule of thumb that is usually uh, accepted and yeah again here in uh, in CCA in the highest uh, risk group we see that uh, yeah we failed that uh, like uh, for many of the covariates so here we have uh, like evidence that we are not uh, adjusting for observed confounding very well uh, the rest of the graphs look fine okay if you want I mean there is there is a couple of covariates that we were we are failing the diagnostic here and uh, and here but yeah um, and the final uh, diagnostic is uh, the negative uh, control analysis so I'm, I'm not sure that if you are aware with this uh, of this uh, method so the a negative control so negative controls are uh, uh, treatment outcome pairs where we know that uh, the relationship the relationship there's no relationship between the, between them right so for example one very commonly used uh, negative control uh, outcome is a uh, ingrown toenail right so if you get if you receive a thiazide probably this is not re related to your ingrown nail right uh, so this is like a lot. We there, there are there exist um, several libraries that can do that uh, within uh, the the Odyssey community. So it, there's uh, uh, algorithms that can propose to you based on uh, 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 what is it uh, based on on liter on available liter literature and uh, treatment descriptions and everything. There is uh, so you can probably you can we generate these uh, uh, like large sets of uh, negative control outcomes, and then for each of these outcomes, we follow the same process as we did for uh, our main outcomes. So we 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 separate into risk strata, and then we fit the propensity scores, and then we evaluate the the relative treatment effect, like the odds ratio in or the hazard hazard ratio in this case. And then we do that like a uh, hundred times or more. And then we we expect that if 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 we had no re residual confounding, like we would expect that ninety five percent of the time our our uh, effect estimates would be not significant. If we if we set uh, a five percent um, uh, alpha right for our tests. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, everything looks fine for MDCD and MDCR, but maybe there is a problem with CCAE again, because we see here that uh, we see this blob here of uh, negative control outcome estimates where we are actually finding a significant effect for outcomes that are not actually related to the treatments, right? And uh, not only that, but whenever we are failing, actually this ends up being above one. So we're finding that the thiazides are actually worse than uh, ACE inhibitors. So this this can be can could be used as an indication that we're having residual confounding, and then that thiazides thi patients receiving thiazides maybe are a bit sicker than the ACE inhibitor patients because they we're finding this. That they're doing actual harm for unrelated outcomes. Um, uh, yeah, so 
yeah, that, that's the that's that's the, the the standard diagnosis that we actually usually uh, evaluate here. And uh, now to the results. Yeah. So. Uh, and can I stop you here? Um, we're yeah. talking about residual confounders, but then uh, I'm assuming that you have like some confounding factors already based on which you're fitting the propensity. Sorry, you're talking about residual confounding, uh, but does it mean that you already have identified a set of confounding factors and after matching on those, based on these results, you're trying to evaluate whether or not there are some residual confounding factors, right? Yeah, so we, uh... Our, uh, the standard approach uh, within uh, Odyssey, in which oh, it's, it's often being criticized about it, is that we are not identifying a set of confounders or potential confounders or everything. So the way we develop the propensity scores mm -hmm. is uh, actually just another lasso logistic regression usually, right? So you throw all the covariates in, <laughs> And uh, you end up with a propensity score model, but now predicting predicting treatment, right? And uh, this is the propensity score model. And actually, they, they they carried out a simulation study where they showed that this actually works, and then you end up with uh, uh, correcting for uh, for the for observed confounding anyway. So we we don't have a set of uh, predefined uh, or, uh, or, or don't have a way to identify confounders per se. But uh, yeah, so we fit these propensity score models and then we, we use these negative controls to see is there, any, is, there, is there evidence that we're not correcting for everything? Uh, yeah, it's and a more, the, yeah. Uh, and the other question is that this negative control experiment, uh, it, was it also stratified based on the risk group? Because I can see the three charts for three yeah. databases, but were they also, uh, so basically which uh, risk group are they for? Yeah, so this is, this is uh, I put here the figure for the overall analysis. So for uh, the entire database, in the paper I have uh, in the supplement, <laughs> I have all the plots, but there are a lot of them. So that's why I didn't put them here, but uh, yeah, so we did it both for the overall and the risk stratified for all databases. So we have all of them, yeah. But you're right, the, here I don't plot the uh, three stratified, it's only the overall. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, regarding the relative effects, now, um, yeah, the overall, so for acute myocardial infarction, we see, we found uh, that hazard ratios pointed towards uh, benefits with high azides compared to ACE inhibitors overall. And then for hospitalization heart failure, uh, maybe less so. And then with stroke, yeah, usually even, not even, maybe not so strong, right? Negligible differences anyway. Um, Now for the uh, regarding the risk stratified analysis. So in the first plot, I plot like the uh, hazard ratios per, per risk group for each database, right? Um, so we, we don't see. So we see in MDCD there is a pattern here that maybe with the increase increase this uh, the benefits with thiazides become less uh, pronounced, uh, but we don't see that any other significant any other not like uh, any other patterns that are like, uh, worth mentioning here. And uh, for the safety outcomes, uh, some things that pop out here are that uh, the, the large benefits with thiazides on the relative scale for angioedema and cough and uh, hyperkalemia, right? So we see that across all risk strata, we have uh, very small hazard ratios for these uh, outcomes. On the other hand, we see this uh, risk increase with uh, on the relative scale for hypokalemia and, hi and uh, hyponatremia, right? Where the opposite thing. So this shows that uh, these results favor uh, ACE inhibitors for these outcomes. 
Um, still, we're all, we're always looking at the risk strata of predicted uh, acute MI risk, right? So the risk strata are the same, and the outcomes that we're estimating change within the risk strata. Um, yeah, and then uh, here I present uh, the results of the affluent uh, effects, which are a bit more uh, interesting, I think. So, uh, so in the left hand side, so we have we're plotting the absolute the absolute benefits with increasing baseline acute MI risk, right? So here we see more of a pattern that with increasing benefit with increasing baseline acute MI risk, your benefits with thiazides also increase. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so here I, so yes, here I, I only plot the, for, for CCAE, I only plot uh, the results for the two first risk strata because we failed the diagnosis before, right? I, I didn't mention that. So I only plot the results for CCAE because we failed the diagnostics for uh, CCA in the higher risk stratum, right? So uh, I don't plot this anymore. Um, but still, even though we're, we're not plotting this, we can see that uh, it still contributes a lot of information because now we see that for lower risk patients, the, the benefits are negligible again for in CCA where we have a lot of patients, right? Um, and then for the safety outcomes, um the yeah things are a bit uh, different now so again as expected so for angioedema and cough we see large benefits for uh for thiazides compared to ACE inhibitors uh, and for hyperkalemia as well right and this is um, a, lot, a lot more pronounced However, for the outcomes of hypokalemia and uh, hyponatremia and hypotension, uh, the opposite things, uh, we have the opposite. So we have uh, higher, uh, so we actually have risk increase when we get, when we prescribe uh, thiazides compared to ACE inhibitors. Um, yeah, so this was a bit confusing, I think, but the overall the interpretation of all this uh, that uh, we came up with was that overall benefits with thiazides for the prevention of acute myocardial infarction that we observe, observed, right? we have found an overall benefit with them. We see that this is mainly driven by high risk patients. So the lower risk patients receive negligible uh, benefits. And however, this, uh, it's the, the risk increase with thiazides for hypokalemia and hyponatremia is not negligible. negligible. So, um, and also the opposite is uh, true for the calf risk where you get, you increase your risk with S inhibitor. So the, it's not, it's not very simple when you, when you try to prescribe, to propose a treatment, the treating, treating physician needs to consider this. So it's not uh, a black and white, kind of uh, uh, situation where you say thiazides are better or safer or everything. But when you look at the risk strategy, you see that a lot more things come up and then the decisions become a little, become more complicated and not that uh, simple to answer. Uh, however, still for higher risk patients, we see maybe that may, it's possible that the benefits for thiazides may outweigh the harms, and, but it's not, this is not true for the lower risk patients. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think uh, mainly that is my presentation. I don't know if you have any questions more. Or, uh... Thank you very much, Alex. So uh, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, let's give our speaker a virtual round of applause. And then if you have any questions, please, uh, please ask. If, oh, okay, so I can start with a question. Um, okay, so since we're talking about risk, can you talk about like the time scale of the data is collected for like when you say myocardial and function risk, um, how long these patients are being observed and like with, yeah. when, uh, how long have they been taking this medication or this treatment and then how long afterwards? 
Yes, so we um, so in the, when we set up the problem, we found out that we didn't have so much uh, so long follow up, right? So we mm -hmm. limited our, our analysis, we censored our analysis at, at two years after treatment initiation. So we required patients to be in the database for at least one year before they were prescribed the thiazide or the ACE inhibitor. Uh, and then we followed them for another two years and we censored at two years. And uh, the other thing is about the, 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 the modeling part, when you mentioned that you're using obstacle vision or lasso or any of the available uh, classifiers, uh, can we talk about like exactly what variables are you using? Because I understand OMAP uh, formatted databases, they include quite a lot of information. So uh, how do you exactly select which which variables to use? What is important? What's not? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what we usually do is that we, uh, yeah, so we set a lot. We define a large set of predefined. Uh, a predefined set of covariates that we usually use, like this includes demographics, uh, treatments, and uh, uh, diseases like uh, prior to being uh, prior to receiving the uh, treatment, uh, thiazide or ACE inhibitor, and then we fit a Lassou logistic regression model. So this is more of an automated. Uh, uh, modeling approach and then in the end we end up with a large set of covariates in the paper in the actual paper i have uh, in the supplement i provide uh, the top uh, uh, i don't remember now 20 i think uh, um, the, the the covariates with the large the, the 20 covariates with the largest uh, uh, coefficients uh, and uh, i don't i don't remember now out of uh, <laughs> The top of my head, of, I'm sure there was like uh, sex and AIDS for sure they were in there. And uh, oh. yeah, uh, maybe you can. But is that, uh, I mean, generically large bunch of covariates or did you uh, do basically employ some kind of domain expertise? Maybe ask experts what kind of covariates do the thing would be useful. I mean, uh, did you have any domain expertise involved or uh, you basically just selected a large enough set of covariates that would cover almost everything? Yes, so the um, uh, so this uh, this analysis for this analysis we actually based our uh, like the whole uh, setup we based it on uh, on top of a previous publication uh, from uh, researchers, in Odyssey, from a Lancet, where they in, in in the Lancet where they compared all all treatments for hypertension for a set of fifty two covariates, right? For mm -hmm. uh, much larger, and then we we actually used only a subset of these uh, analysis for this presentation here. So, because we we don't have uh, any expertise in this field, but we know that when they were developing this. Uh, when were they were when they were carrying out this this previous uh, study, this a lot of domain expertise was in, experts were involved in this. Mm -hmm. So, for uh, all our for the covariates and the uh, uh, definitions of the, what is a, what, what do we mean when we say a patient receives thiazides? What do we mean when a patient receives when we say the patient receives thiazides? then all this stuff? we just transported it to our analysis and we were able to do that because we have this common data structure and then it was easy for us just to take their definitions and use it in our case and then build on top of that but this is building on top of previous uh, work but yeah okay uh, thank you very much and uh, do you have any future plans for this work do you want to explore any further avenues with this or yeah so and an, an easy answer and the one we're working at uh, at the moment is that we are that we want to expand this uh, set of analysis to the entire 
all, 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 all uh, like I said, like the previous study focused on uh, compared all treatments with each other or treatment classes with each other for a much larger set of uh, databases, right? And then a much larger set of outcomes. So we can, we can, we're actually working on that. So we want to supply all these results with re-stratified analysis. And we're actually working on that. And uh, we also we also applied our framework uh, in the field of uh, osteoporosis. And this is a field, this, uh, uh, this is a uh, manuscript that's almost ready to be submitted actually. And uh, after that, we, so we want to move further away from this re-stratified analysis and move to more kind of uh, continuous where you, to more individualized uh, predictions of benefits. Right? And then we, how do we model the, uh, this risk uh, treatment interactions for, uh, for patient, for individualized now predictions and not just uh, subgroups of uh, operation. Moving more but towards the personalized medicine idea than, you know, yeah. the stratified risk group. Yeah. That, that's very interesting. Uh, so let's wait to see if our audience have any questions. Um, if not, then thank you very much for joining us. We'll put this talk up after editing on YouTube. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much.